Hello, welcome to, to this lecture on network virtualization of our course on protocols for data network, also known as advanced computer networks, here from the, the University of Lisbon, Faculty of Sciences. Um, uh, so, so today's le lecture is different from usual. Uh, instead of being a face-to-face -face lecture, it's an online lecture. I, I hope that it's, uh, you still enjoy it. Um, and, and why network virtualization? We, uh, I guess we all know that virtualization has basically revolutionized computing. It completely changes the way that resources are managed and, 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 and how resources and, 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 and are operated. Um, and the question that, that we ask in this question is, is this true for networking? And you may recall from, from, from your past courses on computer networking, uh, that uh, you know, there are many virtualization primitives, what I call primitives, like VLANs, NATs, uh, you may remember those. But uh, uh, what I claim is that there is no network virtualization per se, or there wasn't until very recently. So what I mean by network virtualization here is the a full decoupling of the virtual networks from the substrate or the physical networks that, are, that support the virtual networks. So VLANs and NATs, they are Primitives, they allow a bit of virtualization, but it's not complete network virtualization. And this has been quite a problem. Um, with this, network provisioning is very slow. So if you compare provisioning computing resources when compared with networking resources, so for example, if you want to provision virtual machines, it takes like seconds to minutes to provision these type of resources, whereas it takes months, literally months, to provision networking resources. Um, other problems include mobility is very limited because we know that, uh, uh, for example, IP addresses are fixed to the topology, so it would be nice to virtualize the IP addresses. Uh, and, uh, and many other problems occur because we don't really have full network virtualization until recently. We didn't have. So the game changer uh, in this aspect, as in others, has been software-defined networking, this, this, this new paradigm in, in networking that we've been discussing so many times in, in, in the course of this uh, of the of this course uh, so with SDN by decoupling the networking planes so by removing the basically the control plane from the switches and logically centralizing control in SDN controller we gain this network wide visibility and direct control over the all equipment in the network and that basically has enabled network virtualization complete network virtualization the paradigmatic example is VMware NSX, uh, which is the commercial name for uh, for a, a platform that 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 was that was presented in a paper that some of you have read on uh, called NVP Network Virtualization Platform. This is the first production level cloud scale network virtualization platform, completely entirely based on SDN. You, you see in this picture from VMware. In the middle, you have the NSX controller cluster. That's uh, that's a cluster of SDN controllers controlling the the, the switches at the edge, the open V switches. Um, so logically centralized control of SDN, enabling complete network virtualization. So in today's lecture, the plan is to first we will start with Flowvisor. This was the first SDN-based network virtualization tool. The, the goal of Flow, for Flowvisor was to virtualize SDNs, in particular. Uh, and then we, we move to NVP, which is this one. It's basically NVP is the NSX is the commercial name for NVP. And this was the first production quality network virtualization platform that for the first time enabled the full decoupling of the virtual networks uh, from the substrate network. Okay, so let's start with Flowvisor, uh, the first SDN-based network virtualization tool. So the context and motivation of Flowvisor was a bit different from 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 what I mentioned before, which we, uh, from full network virtualization, let's say. So the problem that they had at the time was that they, they wanted to, to they, they were very much concerned with networking research and in validating networking research, uh, because basically when you propose, for example, a new network protocol, etc., uh, you have to either you run simulations and emulations, uh, which have the problem that they lack realism, or you build a testbed, uh, and then you run the real protocols in real hardware, etc. But that's very hard, that's very expensive, and it is always also very hard to scale. So uh, there were some proposals in the past, like Vini and the Emulab, um, which are two network testbeds that have uh, you know, some scale, and they do improve the status quo. But um, the problem is that uh, packet processing is done in conventional, uh, CP by conventional CPUs and forwarding, which is much, much slower than, than, than real hardware switches and their ASICs. 
so basically it's the difference between processing and forwarding things in software versus processing and forwarding things in hardware so it's very very different uh, it's like a hundred times to a thousand times uh, slower uh, then it's also hard to scale even though th the scale of Vini and Emulab is already interesting for uh, in terms of a testbed and um, uh, it's it's hard to scale as they, they because they exist as a parallel testbed to the production network uh, so the production actor the real network and also there is another problem that basically transferring an experiment that runs on a network of CPUs to specialized hardware such as switches takes considerable effort. So uh, in a few words, so the main problem of a testbed is that it is a testbed, right? And so the proposal of these guys was a, a Flowvisor, uh, which is a testbed that is embedded into the production network. So uh, you run your testbed like inside your production network. Uh, so the magic is that it automatically scales with the global network. So if your network grows, then also your testbed grows, right? This is basically achieved with a technique called slicing. So it's not full network virtualization. You're, you're not really virtualizing everything. You're just slicing the network hardware, okay? This is very important because it's the main difference between Flowvisor and NVP, which we will talk next. So you may ask from your computer networking course, uh, why not VLANs, aren't they enough? Well, uh, first let's recall VLANs. Uh, if you recall, so uh, VLANs, uh, for example, I've given here an example of the simplest VLAN, uh, which is port-based. So it's like, uh, but there are other types of configuration. So you have a, a, a hardware switch, right? And, 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 and you want to use the, the, that switch for multiple virtual lands, right, because you have a chemistry department, a computer science department, and you want things to be separated, you want the broadcast uh, traffic to be separated because you don't want the traffic from chemistry going to computer science, for example. And so you may define in your switch uh, that, uh, you know, the first eight ports uh, belong to chemistry and, and the, the eight other ports belong to, to TS, to computer science. And so you're basically, you know, uh, separating uh, uh, the switches. So one hardware switch uh, is working or operating as multiple virtual switches. This is what uh, VLANs uh, offer. The problem with VLANs is that they, they, they offer the separation of classes of traffic, but they do not provide any means to control the forwarding plan. This is a big difference from Flowvisor. So Flowvisor basically sits between, so it's an SDN-based uh, 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 solution. So we have uh, the open flow switches uh, connected to a Flowvisor that acts basically as a controller to the open flow switches. Okay, so Flowvisor sits between the, 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 the several uh, SDN controllers that are, that are used for research. So we can imagine that Alice, Bob and Kathy, they're uh, running experiments a networking experiments uh, in in a certain part or a certain slice of the of the of the network of the production network, um, and so uh, and Flowvisor sits in the middle, so intercepting all messages and and basically offering you know to to Alice controller it's like if Alice was communicating directly with the OpenFlow switches. Uh, the same for Bob and Kathy, and to the open flow switch, it's the same as, as you know, for, for them, Flowvisor is just a normal SDN controller, okay? So it's transparent in that sense, okay? So uh, each experiment, like Alice experiment, Bob experiment, runs in their own slice of the network, so uh, slices, so it's slicing, and <coughs> as I said, for switches, it, it acts as a normal SDN controller. For users, SDN controllers, it acts uh, as if it were a network of open flow switches. So we're basically, if you look at this, so we're basically virtualizing an SDN because we're virtualizing this SDN control, right? So we have three SDN controllers, but, but each of these thinks that it owns completely the network when it's not the case. It's basically being uh, shared. So the most important uh, aspect here is slicing. How is slicing achieved, slicing of network resources? So there are many axes for slicing. One is bandwidth. So each slice has its own fraction of bandwidth on each link, first of all. So, so they use in the implementation per slice queues uh, in each switch. So, and so basically if you have like two, three tenants using your network, then each tenant will get, for example, one third of the bandwidth of the links that it uses. Um, then we also uh, so so there's also slicing of the forwarding table entries. If you imagine uh, a switch has a finite number 
of uh, you know a finite uh, memory uh, size and the memory size has to hold the forwarding table I'm talking about the the, the fast TCAM memory um, and so you have to you know you have to offer a bit of the forwarding table to each tenant uh, so each slice will have a finite quota of forwarding rules <coughs> and then Flowvisor controls uh, who uses what right by using a counter and uh, we also slide the device CPU, so every switch has a CPU to take care of the control plane, basically. It's, it's the slow bit of, uh, of, of the switch. And, and in Flowvisor, each slice is limited to a fraction of each device's CPU. And then Flowvisor rate limits like new flow messages, uh, like dropping packets when a threshold is exceeded, controller requests, anything that goes to the slow path, that is to the CPU, uh, is also controlled. Uh, uh, and it, um, you, of course, uh, uh, Flowvisor also need a bit of the CPU of switches, so it leaves some CPU aside for bookkeeping. Um, and, and the question that I ask is, uh, now at this stage, is if the CPU becomes overloaded, will packet forwarding continue? What do you think? Of course, because only the control plane, the open flow request, is affected, so the data plane continues uh, unaltered. So it's not a huge problem. It may become a problem. But it's not a very good problem if it's if it happens only for a while. Continuing with uh, slicing of networking resources. Flow space. Flow space is a very important concept. So the flow space is basically a subset of traffic that is controlled by an experiment. Okay. So how do how is the subset defined? Is defined by a collection of packet headers that form a well-defined subspace of the, of all possible packet headers. What this means is, for example, uh, getting back. To, to say to Alice's experience, Alice controller, for example. So Alice may uh, um, may control all traffic that uh, has as source IP uh, uh, IP address, all IP addresses that start with 10.x. Okay, so all addresses that start that start with 10 are controlled by Alice, and all addresses that that start, let's say, at 20 are controlled by Bob. Okay, so so each of these has their own flow space. So these are these two examples are two examples of, of, of flow spaces because all packet headers that have 10 that start with 10 as source IP address are from Alice, and all packet headers that start with 20 as IP source address they belong to uh, to Bob. And then we also have slicing. Uh, uh, slicing of control is achieved by intercepting all open flow messages. So as we saw, Flowvisor sits in between the SDN controllers of the users or the tenants and the switches. So flow, since Flowvisor visor sits in the middle, it intercepts policies and rewrites all control messages. And this is what ensures transparency and isolation. Finally, in terms of topology, each slice will have their own view of the network nodes and the connectivity between them. And this is also enabled by Flowvisor, uh, by, Flowvisor by intercepting all control messages. Okay, so for evaluation, I, I've decided to look at scalability, performance, and isolation. So what we have saw from, from the results of Flowvisor is that uh, they've shown that Flowvisor scales linearly, which is what uh, you would want. Uh, so they have these experiments uh, by increasing the number, the number of, of flows per switch, uh, the frequency of flows per switch, the number of rules per slice, and the number of slices. And what we see is like this uh, interesting linear uh, property of scaling, which is good. In terms of overheads, is there any overhead to the data plane? No. Okay, so they don't touch the data plane, right? Uh, to the control plane, also no. The only thing wh where there are overheads is in between, in these actions that cross the control and data planes. Um, so what I mean is that, like, to the data plane, uh, you know, the, the, the packets in the data plane, they continue running uh, usually at 1 gigabit per second or 10 gigabit per second, whatever is the, the rate below. Uh, also to the control plane, it doesn't change anything because the control plane of every STN controller, like the applications that run in each tenant's uh, uh, STN controller, they don't change. They, there's no overhead there. There's only an overhead when things cross Flowvisor, right? When they cross the control and data planes. Uh, uh, but the overhead was consi it's considered to be relatively uh, small and acceptable, like around 16 milliseconds for new flow messages uh, on average. So it's quite okay. In terms of uh, evaluation, they've, they, they've performed an interesting experiment uh, with uh, showing that one 
there was one experiment in one slice performing a distributed denial of service attack uh, that consumes all bandwidth. And what we see, like in this in this graph here, is that um, uh, if there is no slicing, so this DDoS attack, which is the CBR constant bitrate traffic here, you know, gets almost 100%, whereas TCP, which is the rest of the traffic, gets you know none, right, and of bandwidth. However, when we have slicing. Uh, then the t uh, and we are assuming that uh, the TCP traffic has 70% uh, reservation uh, reserved to them, and 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 the, D the the experiment that performed the DDoS has 30%, and this is what we get. Okay, so this is exactly what you wanted. Um, so there was another example, for example here, uh, or the same example in fact, but but shown differently. Um, uh, with a malicious controller uh, overloading the no, in fact this is a this is a different experiment. I'm sorry. So this is basically a malicious controller uh, overloading the switch CPU, so like you know provoking many flow messages, uh, new flow messages. And what we see here is that without isolation, this you know this has a pr this has this behavior when when at, at this moment when the number of requests per second is very high, so you get 100% utilization due to that malicious controller uh, with isolation. You know uh, the figure is much much better. So these problems do not occur with slicing. So that and that was that was the goal.